I'm Van Nguyen. Welcome to the program where my guest is Maria Jun, a Vietnamese Australian actress, martial artist, producer and director. Maria has played an integral role in the creative development of the Australian Vietnamese film movement, especially by challenging gender stereotypes and exploring the female action. She has starred in films such as Maximum Choppage, Fist of the Dragon and most recently Vietnamese action blockbuster Tracer, where she played the female antagonist against Vietnam's leading actress Jun Ngoc An. Having produced many short films with notable awards, perhaps one of Maria's most exciting projects has been a transmedia documentary, which ultimately led her to meeting and working with her longtime action idol, Hong Kong superstar Jackie Chan. With a dream of helping pave the way for women from culturally diverse communities to succeed in Australia's film and television industry, Maria remains continually active in training, motivating and encouraging others to pursue their passion for the arts. Maria Jun, welcome to Full Story. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Let's begin by asking if you know the story of how your parents came over here to Australia. Mm. It's, um, to be honest with you, it's a story that hasn't really been discussed. But I, I, in general, I get the point that they, you know, they fled from Vietnam during the, the Vietnam War. Um, they went to Malaysia, they settled there, and then finally they got processed and came to Australia and settled in Cabramatta. And they moved a, a lot around just to find work and try to rebuild their lives as well as try to to, you know look after their kids and hopefully they grow up to contribute to Australia. Mm. You just mentioned that you moved around a lot at a young age with your parents. Did that affect you in any way growing up? Yes. Um, growing up it was like when you move, each time you move you feel displaced you know and then all the friendship groups that you kind of create they, they disappear so each time moving around spaces it's like as if I'm always having to reset resets so I've never actually got a chance to develop you know a group of friends and I hated moving around because each time I moved around I had to go to a new school and that school will have a new bunch of bullies that I have to deal with you know as well as try to find people that are you know connected that will connect with me and, and create that friendship and then once I have to leave again, I have to reset again. So it was annoying. I hated it. And, but my parents had to do it because they were looking for work. They were looking for restaurant work or uh, farm work or wherever they hear a rumour that there's a farm somewhere, they'll just basically, you know, uproot and go. Mm. How did you find that? You said it was difficult to find new friends and then you have to face the bullying aspect of everything. Did your Vietnamese side in any way play a factor of you being bullied? Mm. I think um, when I was in Queensland, I was probably one of probably two Asians in school. So therefore, we kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, a lot of times we were called Chinese, which was annoying because I was Vietnamese, but at the same time I kind of wished I was Chinese at that time because nobody know what like a Vietnamese person looks like. No one knows, everyone's like, what's Vietnamese? It's like, it's Chinese, same thing, right? And it, to me, growing up, it caused a little bit of anxiety because I felt that why do I, why am I feeling like as if I'm like the Aboriginal, the Southeast Asian culture, <laughs> you know, like a minority. And at the same time, like people just kind of like don't want to discuss it. They kind of just want to clump you up into being Chinese. But um, it, it did play a part in a sense that, you know, sometimes I didn't want to be Asian. I didn't want to be my ethnicity. I wanted to have blonde hair, blue eyes, because those types of kids got along with each other. Whereas I was always the one sitting in the corner wishing that I could be them. And that was constant year after year after year, just sitting there fantasizing that I was something, I wished I was something else. Did you ever um, overcome that kind of internal conflict with yourself? Are you now proud to be Vietnamese Australian? I think it took a long time. I think it was during the, the primary school, the high school, the bullying, and I think it came to a point where, you know, I really wanted to know what, what is this being Vietnamese is all about. And I guess my mom put me into Vietnamese school, even though I didn't do very well at that. But I think it was more now in the last probably five years that I really embraced um, my culture because, you know, uh, not only being a part of Gong Lam, 
um, in Sydney, but also you know doing projects in Vietnam, as well as connecting with people of my generation who not necessarily are good at Vietnamese, but they kind of have a yearning because it's like you're in Australia. No one's going to say, "Oh, you're Australian," because Australians going to look at you and go, "No, you're you're Asian." So therefore, you have to kind of embrace it, and if not, you kind of just float. And I felt for myself, especially in film and television and acting, that I need to have a voice, and especially a voice that represents Vietnamese women, who a lot of the times are seen as submissive, you know. But but to be honest with you, like they're not, because four thousand years ago, you, have you heard of the Hai Ma Chung story, which is you know the Chung sisters, and they were warrior women. They were fighters. They were leaders. They overthrew like the Han Dynasty for three years. So these are the sort of the ethos, the, the the mentality that I want women these days to have. That not the fact that they're they're women, they're Vietnamese, that that it's it's a disadvantage, but the fact that if they can actually understand their voice and their journey, and are able to communicate it with people and really get that fire in people, I think that's how things are going to change. Let's talk about strong women.、Um, you yourself are an actress, a filmmaker, and a martial artist. That's a very powerful combination of skills to have.、Mm. I guess,、um, and it's to be honest with you, it, it's something that、um, came about as a bit of an alter ego because growing up, I got bullied. Okay, growing up, I watched movies like, for example, Jackie Chan and. You know Donnie Yen and all all these movies that I was watching. I go, you know, I wish there was a female version of this, this underdog story. So I always would do a lot of role playing myself, and you know, and I always was captivated towards what's on screen, because film and television kind of in a way influences how generations, how people treat each other, and how people see themselves, whether they see themselves as the Asian psychic. Or actually, a hero, and a lot of the films from Hong Kong or from Asia produce these heroes that I really like,、um, gravitated towards. But、um, pretty much, I would probably say that、um, you know, for my journey and being a strong woman, it's not something that I kind of like said I want to be a strong woman. I kind of just discovered it through people saying, "Hey, you know what? You represent us." And at that time, I'm like, actually, you know what? I feel good that I'm able to. Venture off and do all these things, and to be honest, I haven't studied、um, film school or acting school, and I actually teach at some of the top schools in Australia, you know. And and the, even for me to get through the door, and I remember going for the for well, I wasn't even going for an interview. They actually called me again, Maria. We heard that you do a lot of, of outreach stuff out in the community, and apparently you're really good at you know working with kids, working with at risk. You know, culturally diverse people. So we want to bring you in and, and actually see what you do, and that was how I got my foot in the door. But even then, going teaching there, people used to be, oh, are you the cleaner? Oh, you are you the are you with the international students? So it's, on, it's in D block. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm teaching here. They go, right? Like they just look at me like, yeah, you wish. And I have to show my ID. They have to call down the you know the coordinators, and then they finally let me in to teach my class. And it's annoying because I'm like, why do I get that? Where everyone else gets it, like you know, they get to go through. Why do I always have to be questioned? My 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 credentials, my my credibility. You know, it's it's annoying. At the same time, I have to sort of just smile and take it because I'm Asian, I'm submissive. And if I, if I was to speak out, it was oh oh Maria, she's she's getting feisty. She's the the, the dragon lady's coming out. You know, so these are the things that I find that are constantly are faced, but. With every moment, every challenge that's thrown at me, I find that it's much more.、Um, I guess there are better outcomes if I process it. If I go, okay, what was that? Why did that experience happen to me? Why did they think this of me? How do I break it down, reverse engineer it, and actually find ways for them to not do that again and not do that to other Asian women? So that's how I, I've, I've learned that my I'm going to be this. Kind of vessel for these experiences to happen, for these conflicts to happen, so that it's a learning curve for the greater, 
you know, of the Vietnamese, you know, community or women. Mm. Please, did you see Bernie? Do you know what happened to him? <laughs> you said that you didn't have the credentials to become a teacher or even be an actress or filmmaker. You were studying the Bachelor for Psychology. Um, when was it exactly the moment in time that you realised that you had a passion for acting and filmmaking? I think during, um, to be honest with you, like because I moved around a lot, um, when I went back um, to Sydney, the, the issue with that was that they wouldn't allow me to kind of like uh, continue that year and they wanted me to, the school wanted me to repeat and I was begging them, I don't want to repeat, I want to continue. So finally when I got a chance to continue, I had to really work really hard, like study really hard to at least get somewhere. And I remember putting in the application, they go, okay, well, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I don't know, I'm kind of like a tomboy, I want to do Bachelor of Policing. So I put that down, they go, oh, you want to try something else? Like think of something that has ology after it. And I'm like, okay, I'm looking down the list, I'm like, oh, psychology, the study of psychos, <laughs> you know, because that's kind of cool. Didn't, it didn't turn out that way. And I ended up getting that. Um, and I studied it for five years and that was pretty much how I got into understanding the mind and understanding the intricacies and the complexities of human beings. And during that time, um, on the weekend, I would uh, participate and make short films with this group of like boys out in Western Sydney. And we had this dream that we want to make films that, so that Jackie Chan can watch. It was a complete crazy dream. And I remembered always like pushing the boys, yeah, yeah, we can do this. If we just imagine, if we manifest it and we believe and we, we let people know our, our crazy project, which ended up calling, uh, being called Maximum Troppage. And that ended up uh, five years later became an ABC TV show on um, ABC. So that was good, but at that time, I was acting in that as well as making that short film. And I loved the process. I loved being able to explore characters and just be somebody that I'm not necessarily used to. So that's the thing with acting. You're allowed to become more confident. You be, you're you allowed to be a warrior, a strong woman, even if you, you're not that. So it allowed me to escape. And that's when I started to really enjoy the process of that. You're very passionate about what you do. Were your parents supportive of you? <laughs> my parents. I think um, it took a lot of pitching to my parents. And I think I realised even in general with people, the more passionate you are, the more they can see the fire, they, most of the time they just back away and they just let you do your stuff. And especially being Asian, we're very like submissive. No, I wouldn't say submissive, but I would probably say more quiet. They'd be like, oh yeah, I want to act. So like, I, I really want to act, mum. This is going to be it. This is my, you know, we, we don't really, we don't show the enthusiasm. We always downplay it. So therefore, when we downplay our passions, people think, oh, you're probably not serious. And then they'll talk us out of it. So my parents had moments where they were worried, but I think because they see me being happy and they see the effect I have on people and the fact that they are proud in some s certain extent of what I do because it's different. Because they're sort of, you know, Vietnamese parents are used to, okay, you got to have the job, a stable job, a stable, you know, relationship, kids, da da da, because that's all they know. And I think it's important for me to showcase the Vietnamese community. There's more to that. There's more in different fields that we need to flourish so that our culture is preserved for years to come. Let's talk about your awards and achievements. Your first short screenplay was called Happy Dent in 2008, which led you to a micro series called Downtown Rumble. Can you take me back to your memory of the version of events that followed? So I think before that I was doing more projects in like uh, martial arts, kung fu kind of short films. And then eventually I think I came to a point where I'm like, you know, I actually want to know what is it like to film things, cut things up, and the process of filmmaking, not just sort of be a part of someone else's project. So therefore, um, you know, I knew I was going to go back to Vietnam, but I also wanted to do something. I want to learn more about, you know, the country, the people. 
And eventually I was doing some research and I came across like, um, uh, it's like a Mayan, uh, uh, like the tomb, that kind of like a like an orphanage place that I wanted to just hang around and teach them filmmaking, teach them English, teach them anything that they want to learn and give them tools to play with, like a, you know, a camera. So I ended up doing that project and as I was doing that project and filming, not really knowing what I'm going to get, there was one street kid that kept on following me around everywhere and he would just take me to places, the most dingiest places, family, friends, bullies, you know, and it was just interesting that he was telling me his story as, as we were going along and and also wanting to recreate it because he, he had his dream was like, you know, he would always want to be in a film so that it could be screened one day. And then that just kind of clicked to me, like, let's let's make this little film together. And that's the process of how Happy Debt came about, just hanging around and being friends with the street kid, but not sort of like, oh, I feel sorry for you, but more like, hey, I want to know you as a person. And he was a little kid, eight year old, very smart, he knew all the nooks and crannies of Vietnam. And at the same time, also, it was sad for me seeing the underbelly of Vietnam, you know, the underbellies of what an eight year old boy um, have to be subjected to sometimes, you know, to actually, you know, sell gum. And, and a lot of it is quite, almost quite traumatic for me. But at the same time, like, you know, I, I wanted to do this, this film, make it. And then when I got back home, I just had a bunch of footage. I didn't know where to start. So once I went through it, I realized I started weaving this story together. And then I submitted it to a festival and it pretty much took out like two pretty big awards. At the same time, when I was watching, I was crying because I'm like, you know, realizing that filmmaking, it, it wasn't like all set up. It was very organic. And the person that I'm seeing on screen is a real person and it's a real story. And, and just the fact that he's, he's looking back at me and he's not there. So for me to have to come back to Australia and actually realizing that I'd have a real interaction with this person, that now I go back to my normal life, but they're still continuing this life. It was quite conflicting because in a sense, you realize this is Vietnam. This is the, you know, the in inequity over there. Um, and at the same time, what, what can young people do? You know, what can, you know, one person do that could shed light on that? And like, filmmaking is one thing, but at the same time, there needs to be more ongoing things. And it kind of ate me up a bit because I'm like, what do I do? Do I shut out Vietnam? Do I shut out all this stuff and just continue on with my life? I don't know, and, and to this day, you know, that, that's always been a, a, an image that was a moment in my life that made me realize that if I was a filmmaker or an actor, it can't just be for me. It has to be for a greater good, for more people, so they can understand stories. Let's just talk about another award that you received in 2009 mm. for a short uh, film script titled A Little Dream. Mm. You had the opportunity of working with another Vietnamese Australian film mm. director, Qua Do. Yes. Um, a Little Dream was, um, my, it was actually my first piece of dramatic writing. And I think um, growing up, there's a lot of tension in my family, like especially my mum. She had bipolar disorder, my dad left my mum, a lot of dramas in the family. And I think I wanted to encapsulate what kids go through. And I think children, particularly at a certain age, they're very optimistic. As much as everything around them is like falling apart and their mum's always very angry, always berating them, but they're always trying to find the, the light, the love in moments. So therefore, I wrote that story about this girl really wanting to just give her mum, you know, Mother's Day present, you know, in the midst of the pain and, and the, the, the miscommunication and dysfunction of a family, she's still trying as an eight-year-old. And I kind of want, especially adults, that film so that Vietnamese adults understand that their kid is still you know, an entity, they're making choices. They're making choices that to contribute to the family system, to the happiness of the family. They're not just kids that they don't know enough. They do know, they're very smart, but you just gotta to have to allow and give them the opportunity and see that without just cutting them short. So that's, that's sort of like um, the short film that I made. And Kwa came on board as a mentor. He, he read through my script and he gave me ideas. And it was really good because at that time, 
I was like an up and coming, you know, emerging, starry eyed kind of filmmaker, or really pseudo filmmaker, because I didn't come from film school. I just basically won this competition. I got this grant to make this film. And then I wanted to work with Qua because he was Vietnamese. You know, he was probably the only one that I know in, in Australia that was in our community, um, in our you know, demographic, doing what he's done. And I really wanted to kind of pick his brain to really know what, what drives him as well. So that was a good opportunity to do that. And speaking about exploring new things, mm. you quite clearly have a uh, strong influence from Jackie Chan. Yes. In 2011, you pursued documenting a transmedia film project called Quest for Jackie Chan. Mm. What did that project entail? And it was rather large because it uh, took over six years to <laughs> yes. complete. Yeah. I, to be honest with you, it was one of those projects where it came from angst, okay? So after I did Maximum Tropage, I was like, okay, is there any more opportunities in Australia to do stuff? Like, do we have to keep on making these independent films and that's our only way to express ourselves? I was angry. I was like, what shall I do? And then I had a, one of my work colleagues was just like, you know, she was like, why don't you just go find Jackie Chan and just tell him that? And I was like, how am I going to find Jackie Chan? You think it's easy to find Jackie Chan? He's the biggest like movie star in the world. Well, me, I want to go, hey Jackie, I've got problems. Australia is not like happy with Asians, you know? But then it kind of clicked to me. I was like, wait a minute, this is, this is, this, we're hitting something. And then I came up with the idea, what if it's a project about me trying to find Jackie? And at that time I had no clue if I'm going to meet Jackie, but we made it a transmedia project because I wanted to connect with people who had ideas and thoughts and stories about Jackie and how they perceive Jackie as, you know, and the people who perceive Jackie as, you know, representing Asians on screen or representing the migrant experience or the underdog or someone who works really, really, really hard and finally makes it. So these are the themes I basically explored around Jackie Chan. To be honest, Jackie Chan was just a metaphor. It was a metaphor to say that anything's possible if you kind of just put it out there and you work really hard towards it. So I basically traveled around Australia in 21 days, collecting all these stories with my camera, and then went to China, went to Hong Kong, and then came back and I didn't meet Jackie, you know? And it was sad because I'm like, okay, I finished the project and I pretty much folded the project. It was only years later that it finally emerged again when Screen New South Wales um, government agency was like, hey, Maria, uh, have you met Jackie yet? We heard about your project. We heard about the celebrations and all that stuff. He went around Australia, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And like, hey, do you, you want to meet Jackie and, and, and work with him? And I was like, oh my gosh. And it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes you don't, like, you think about it, you go, you know, if I didn't even do that project, if I didn't just throw it out there, I mean, I had not a clue if I want to meet Jackie or not, to be honest. I was just, in my head, everyone's like, you're going to meet Jackie, right? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking, I don't know, but I'm just going to put it out that I will. If all these things happen, it will. And then finally, getting a chance to work with Jackie, you know, it was amazing. Five weeks and seeing how he works and he knows me as well. So he's seen my stuff. He's pilot, right? Who, who flies him around. He goes, hey, I know you. You, done, you do all those YouTube clips. And I was like, oh my God, like what a small world. You know, the fact that my little outcomes have you know reached out to people and he's like the biggest megastar ever and he's he's he was amazing to to hang around because he's, he's a bit of a joker prankster he's always like giving me wet willies or or sort of go what do you do what do you do he's always asking me just random stuff like that and then finally before he left we went on a road trip to Canberra just me his family and a few people and I was like man out of all people on set there's like hundreds of people you've allowed me to go on your journey to see your family, you know? So bizarre as it is, if I didn't put it out there and without all the angst of, you know, why isn't there Asians on the screen, this and that, it would not have led to me to meet Jackie. And I feel like even meeting him is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. So I need to finish the project. I need to continue what I need to do in the martial arts action genre because there's no women in it at all. Last year, you went to Vietnam to shoot a Vietnamese action blockbuster mm. called Tracer or Dresat. Mm. Um, can you explain to me the character you played, Phuong Lu? Yeah. Um, what her, was her role? Well, basically, um, on Tracer, um, it was um, a project that's 
produced by Jung Ok-an, and she's a very, um, I would say, very strong woman. She is a woman that always wants to see women's roles rise up, and that's why she made films where always having women as the, the lead characters and women who are complex, not one color. And that's what I love about her. And and I think when I got over there, to be honest with you, I didn't really have an official role. It was just like some small little role, but. Um, with the help of you know the director, and we also had an action director from you know Sydney that came over there. They built upon a role for me, which is Fung Lu. And and to be honest, like the system in Vietnam, how they make films is very fast and furious. So by the time we're shooting, the script is still getting changed. Some things are added, some things are taken out, you know. And I think my role was allowed to grow, and I felt that because I was quite passionate about my role. So each time when I was on set, I was making sure, you know, I put in all my emotional energy at that point when you know my character lost her her fiance to her losing control to her trying to seek revenge, you know, to her not not even you know allowing someone to defeat her and actually committing suicide and dying, you know, all of that. I felt that I was really passionate about that character, and I really wanted to show people that. You know, even if you have a supporting small role, you can own it as much as you can because when people, when it's in the cinemas, people are going to watch things and people want to feel things. You know, you don't want to just think that oh, I'm just a small role. I'm just going to do whatever. No, small roles. There's no such thing as a small role. You know, it's it's just about you and how you actually inject your energy and your enthusiasm. But for that project, to be honest with you, I got a chance to learn about. Vietnamese culture, Vietnamese people, the film industry, and I can tell you that the film industry over there, they're they're growing, and there's a lot of people, Vic Gills, they're going back there because they know that screen culture is important because this shows people that you know Vietnam is not living in sticks and Vietnamese people are not farm people. Vietnamese people have stories, they have interesting lives, they have complexities, they have conflict. You know we're human beings, and that's shown through film. And for me, that was the bigger picture of the industry because our the Vietnamese film industry on the outside, comparison to internationally, we're not there yet. You know we're not anywhere. But at the same time, we, I can see there's a drive, there's a push that we want to be something because this is going to represent our people. The fact that you got to represent Viet Gill, Vietnamese mm. Australians, in a big production like Tracer, mm. that must have been very special. It it was special, but I think at that time when filming, it was so frantic that we I didn't really think about the bigger picture. But at the same time, stepping back, I'm so glad that I did go because there was a lot of you know there was a lot of issues me going over there. But at the same time, you know what? I kind of blocked it out. It was white noise because I'm thinking. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this for a bigger cause, and the next generation of young people don't understand all the all the the past issues. We we respect it. We understand the fact that this is what our parents gone through. But at the same time, we want to find ways to build our culture. And think about it: three thousand years. I mean, Vietnamese culture has been going through conflict for thousands of years. You know what I mean? So therefore, it's something that in, is in, in, inevitable. And I think. For us, for young people, next generation, we want to find different ways on how to address things as well. Not just going through one direction, but we're finding ways to celebrate our culture and maintaining that for even our kids um, in future. Let's talk about your martial arts projects. Mm -hmm. You recently were part of, or you organised with Hissy Fit, mm -hmm. a project called Women of Fairfield. Mm -hmm. Um, can you explain what that is? Yeah, so um, Hissy Fit basically found me out through uh, the local area, and they wanted to collaborate with a martial artist to devise um, a video installation as well as a theatre piece. And it was a very interesting process because it's the first time that I'm kind of approached saying, "Hey, we love your martial arts," and I was like, "Yeah, cool, cool, cool," but that's not really me. Me is me, normal, you know. I don't have to do all this stuff to be seen, right? And I think it was an interesting process because, for even for them, knowing that actually, you know, being Asian or being, you know, martial artist isn't like the Lucy Lou's or you know what they see on screen. It's actually quite different. The experiences are quite different. 
it, and we're not doing this because we're anti-male because sometimes they have a there's a pre like we're dragging ladies like you, we hate men or whatever it's not that it's finding ways for them to kind of like downplay you know the the stereotypes which was quite interesting but at the same time for me to also understand that this is a representation of what parts of mainstream depict people like me and I think it was interesting to even negotiate what kind of stories what kind of form that was presented and I eventually did um a solo martial arts piece with the line dancing uh, head that I redesigned to be a demon. So basically it was a depiction of a woman but uh, as a demon, but being able to get out of that demon, the fighting against herself or fighting against the system to actually fully become expressive and embracing who she is. And martial arts was uh, something is more like a fight against the system a fight against you know being told that this is the box you belong in and that's some of the themes that i i draw drew out from the project not that we're just cool with numchan you know because that's just very superficial you know we want to derive deeper and meaningful things and especially in fairfield there's a lot of domestic violence so i wanted to borrow elements of that into the theater piece as well so there was that element the fantastical element as well as um, something that people can resonate with when they're watching it, something powerful, movement and slow, but at the same time, very emotional. So I, there was a, literally, after when I finished that piece, I was like uh, almost about to collapse. Because when I get into character, I get into an emotion, a movement, I really feel it. It's like it's my heart's about to pop out, you know? And I think for, for them, it, it was an interesting process because it's not them saying, hey, this is what we think you should do. It's like, God, she's, this girl is full on because she won't, accept what we give her she's always renegotiating things you know renegotiating storytelling renegotiating the the identities and we when we say her oh, chop socky stuff she's not going to accept she'll hey that's that's racist <laughs> you know? and then, um, okay <laughs> so that's 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 an interesting process and i think it was a, quite a successful um project but it's a project that really pushed me like to the point where I was like, why am I doing this? If people don't understand where the plight of Asian women are coming from, then why do I have to keep on explaining to these people? But at the same time, I realized, you know what, this is a part of the process. It's, it's a part of finding my own inner patience about this and finding different ways to get my point across and not always having to be blah, 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 you know, and scaring people off with that. Yeah. Do you find that, in your opinion, your Vietnamese heritage helped you to follow the martial arts acting and filmmaking and make it become one, essentially? Mm, that's an interesting one because I think Vietnam, my Vietnamese heritage didn't actually come in um, until probably the Tree Sack project um, and then also being a part of Gong Lam for like three years. That combined gave me more of a drive to know what is Vietnamese culture, like when did it all started, uh, what was some of the uh, interesting battles or people throughout the ages of the Vietnamese culture, like Habit Chung and Chao Hung Dao, all that stuff, like I didn't even know about. You know, and I don't think most people don't know about because there's no point in caring because there's no stories out there. There's not, if you think about it, you Google it, you don't find a lot of information. And you don't find a lot of video clips or ex explanation on it. And to be honest, the Haiba Jung story, it derived from the Chinese version of it, which is like these two women, barbarians, who wouldn't be submitted. And that's their version of it. And I, at the moment, I've just be completed writing a screenplay for Haiba Jung. So at the moment, um, Ji Jung Oban is looking at it and looking at making that and hopefully into a film. And that's a really big deal um, and that's still under wraps but that, again we need stories that make our culture proud of who we are on the big screens you know because as I said if not it's going to get rewritten you know by other people because other people other things out there have more resources and they can do it that's why it's so important that our Vietnamese people we work together you know to actually um, you know encapsulate these stories for years to come. Hmm. Maria Jen, thank you so much for coming all the way from Sydney to Melbourne to join us in the studio. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much, Ben. <laughs>